Have you ever been in a situation where you misread something? You thought it was one thing or maybe it turned out to be something different? Our family, we spent almost nine years living overseas and when you live overseas, there are times where you misread things about other people or sometimes people misread lots of things about you. Um, I remember a time where my wife, she looked at me one day and she said, you need to go fishing. And I've learned over the years that if my wife looks at me and she says, you need to go fishing, what that really means is I'm getting kind of hard to deal with at home. I need to leave the house and go be outside so I can recharge. So I will admit living in a city at that point of 16 million people, it has a tendency to kind of grate on you. Um, so I did what every good husband should do. I grabbed my fishing rod and grabbed my stuff and I planned a day to where I could be outside. Now, when you're in a city of 16 million people, getting away is not easy. You have to intentionally plan it. So I found a lake that I could go to and I drove to the lake, I parked. I had to hike about a mile from where I parked to get down to the water. And when I got down to the water, it was peaceful. There wasn't anybody else around and it was wonderful. And I began casting my rod out and reeling in and fishing. And I felt like I was back in Texas in some ways. And maybe not West Texas, but, uh, uh, but as I was casting and walking along the bank, I looked up and I see a campfire and there's a guy sitting at a campfire along the way. Didn't think anything about it, just kept on fishing. And then a little bit later, this guy yells at me. He says, hey, come drink some tea with me. The last thing I wanna do when I'm out fishing is stop and go over and sit down and drink tea with this guy. And so I said, thank you, I'm fishing right now. I'm, I'm just gonna keep going. And so I kept on fishing. A little bit later, he yells at me again. Hey, come drink tea with me. I said, thank you, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the invitation, but I really would like to fish. So I kept on fishing. And then a little bit later, he yelled at me a third time. But this time he yelled something different. He looked and he yelled at me and he said, hey, come drink tea with me. If you don't come drink tea with me, we're gonna fight. <laughs> so at that point I said, it's time to go drink some tea. So I picked up my stuff, and as I walked and I get closer to the campfire, I realized I had misread this situation. Because what I had thought was just a guy sitting by a fire drinking tea was an elderly man. He was sitting there, and he was drinking tea, but he had no pants on. So I was looking in shock at, okay, this is odd, this is not normal. Um, so I sat down on a log next to him and began to drink tea and began to get to know him. And I realized I, I totally misjudged that situation. And he told me in our conversation that he was 70 years old and he was really excited to go to the lake that day. And so he got up that morning, he had his tea, he had his snacks, he had everything ready. He got in the car and then about halfway to the lake, he realized he forgot to put his pants on. And, and so he said, I'm 70 years old, I'm going to the lake anyway. So he went to the lake and spent the day there drinking tea without pants on. And so sometimes when you misread a situation, it's funny, like that one, but sometimes it's not always that way. Sometimes there's a little more serious consequences that come with it. There was a day, I remember, my wife and I, we were in our language class together. And so we're sitting and we're with our language helper and she's sitting across from us. She's a Muslim woman. She was incredibly kind um, and she was a very moral lady. And in class, she began talking to us and asking questions about America and American culture. She had traveled there at one point and she starts talking about abortion and other sexual issues that were in American culture that were wrong. And I agreed with her, I was like, yes, these things are wrong. They, they should not be in our culture. And then she starts talking about political figures and starts talking about presidents and which presidents she supported. And so as I'm understanding her moral position, 
I say, oh, well, you would have voted for so-and-so had you lived in America. And at that point, everything changed. Her face began to fill with rage, and I thought she was going to come across the table and strangle me. Because the man whose name that I mentioned, she associated with all of the things that she morally detested. She thought that was the guy who supported it. Where in actuality, the guy that she supported was the one who was in support of all the things. She had it totally opposite. And whenever I exposed her to the truth, it came out in rage because she began to realize that this would drastically affect her life. If what I said was true, the conversations that she sits down and has with all of her friends drinking tea are going to have to be different because what she believed about somebody was actually not what was true. Do you ever do this? Do you ever base your ideas, your thoughts of who someone is totally on assumptions? Today, that's what I want us to examine from this passage in Mark. Um, it's really important the question that we're going to look at today, because this isn't a question that has eternal consequences to it. So we read it just a second ago, but in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 29, this is what it says. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. That's important. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. You can flip over to the Matthew version of this story. And in Matthew, you get a little bit more detail about parts of this conversation. Because in Matthew, when Peter answers, he doesn't just say, you're the Messiah. He says, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So as Jesus asked his disciples, I ask you the same thing. Who do people say that Jesus is? If you were to walk out these doors into the city today, who would they say Jesus is? Would they say, he's a good teacher? Would they say, oh, he, he was a good prophet? Would they say, oh, he, he was just a good man? But what about the second question? That one pokes just a little bit harder. Who do you say Jesus is? This is a question we all have to answer. And I hope that your answer is more than just a prophet or a teacher or a good man. Because how you answer this question reveals something about you that has eternal consequences. So in order for us to understand this passage, I think it's important for us to look at what the Jews were expecting in a Messiah. Because they took the Old Testament and they took scriptures from the Old Testament and those scriptures from the Old Testament painted a picture of who they expected the coming Messiah to be and what they expected him to do. So you can go back to scriptures like Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 3.15, you get this prediction that somebody from the line of Eve is going to come and crush the head of Satan. So it insinuates that whoever this is, they're going to have more power and they'll have more authority than Satan has. Or you keep going through the book of Genesis and you get to chapter 49 and Jacob is blessing his sons. And as Jacob is blessing his sons, he talks about this scepter. The scepter that would not depart from Judah and how all the other tribes would have their obedience under him. This idea of a royal king. And then in 2 Samuel, you get this royal identity enhanced even more from the Davidic covenant. There's one who was be from the line of David who would sit on the throne forever. And they would have rest from their enemies. The idea that their enemies would be subjugated to, who, to them. They would be over them and have rest under this king who was coming. And then in Isaiah, 
You get the prophet who describes the future king as a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. It takes this idea and it shows the Messiah is not just a normal human. There's something different about this person. He's a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots, and it states that he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. The prophet Jeremiah also affirms the Messiah as a reigning king. He was a righteous branch who would execute justice. So the Jews had all of these scriptures that they put together and it created this idea for them of this really powerful conquering king who would come and whoever was oppressing them, he would take them, he would restore Israel to its righteous place, to its right place as a dwelling place for God and they would live in peace and security and prosperity. They expected the Messiah to come and to kick the Romans out to conquer the Romans who were the ones oppressing them at that point in time and then put them in charge so they could live in security and prosperity. There were other prophecies as well, prophecies that spoke to the Messiah's suffering, but they didn't gain as much attention as the idea of the conquering king, especially when you're one that's being oppressed like the Romans were oppressing them in that day. So I want us to look back at Peter's response to Jesus' question. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus responds back to him. In the Matthew account, Matthew 16, verses 17 and 18, you get where Jesus replies and he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So when Peter responds to Jesus, he gets the answer technically right. He says the right thing, you are the Messiah, but he doesn't understand the implications of the words that have just come out of his mouth. So Jesus tells him that his answer was not from him, but it had been been revealed to him by the Father. And then Jesus makes an unusual statement if you don't understand the geography. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So what's the big deal with geography? Well, Jesus was an incredible teacher. He was fantastic at shaping a situation and putting it together so that he could make the point that he wanted to make. And Jesus took his disciples to an odd place. He took them to Caesarea Philippi. Any of you know anything about Caesarea Philippi? That's an odd place for a Jewish rabbi to take his disciples to. Why was it odd? Well, it was odd because Caesarea Philippi was an important city for ancient pagan religions. In the Old Testament, it had a different name. In the Old Testament, it was known by the name Benias. And the thing that the city was known most for was a giant cave. You had a big cave, and out of this cave came a spring of rushing water. And the Canaanites, when they lived there and they worshipped Bel... The Canaanites called this the gates of hell. And they would take people to it to determine if they were innocent or guilty. They would throw them into the waters coming out of this cave. And if they survived, they said, well, I guess you must be innocent. But most likely they were going to be killed as they were tossed into the water and drug across the rocks. After the Canaanites, you have the Greeks who come. And the Greeks keep the religious significance of this cave and they called it the gates of Hades. This is where they thought that their Greek gods would disappear to in the wintertime. And then in the spring, they would do whatever they could to entice the gods to return from the underworld 
They saw the cave as an entrance to the underworld, and they wanted their gods to come back and to bring spring and bring everything back to life again. And then after the Greeks, you get the Romans. And when the Romans come, Herod the Great gives the city to his son Philip, and Philip names it after him. He builds a temple in the city to the emperor. So along with all of the other gods being worshipped, you have emperor worship that's taking place in the city as well. And at Jesus' time, the main god in Caesarea Philippi was the shepherd's god, Pan. Pan was recognized by being half goat and half man. And the Greeks thought that he was born out of this cave. And he was often associated with music and fertility. And each spring, the people of Caesarea Philippi engaged in incredibly wicked deeds to try to get Pan to return from this cave. They engaged in prostitution and they engaged in sexual encounters with goats and humans together to be able to get Pan back out of the cave. So why is this geography important? Why would Jesus bring his disciples to this place? Because Jesus makes a play on words. He's making a point, giving visual references for his disciples. But he makes a play on words regarding rocks in the gates of hell in this passage. Standing in this place that's known for the big giant cave, the big giant rock, with the stream coming out of it that was called the gates of hell. And he's talking to a guy named Peter whose name means rock. So standing in front of the gates of hell, talking to a guy whose name means rock, he says he will build his church on this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is masterful. He's giving them a visual picture of what's going to come. What's the rock he's going to build his church on? Is it the cave? Is it Peter? Or is it the confession that Peter made? What's the answer? Well, the answer is yes. Because what we see is that Jesus is building his church in a real physical place. And he's building it through real physical people. Peter had a key role in the early church, but so did all the other apostles and Paul. It wasn't just Peter who had that role. But Jesus brings specific attention to the confession that Peter makes. It's the confession is the point of the passage. This is what he says God has revealed to him. And so... The confession is our main point of what's going on in this passage. So Peter, he's going to play a key role in the future of the church, but Jesus is saying he's building his church through his people, proclaiming the correct confession of who he is. And he says the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not prevail against it. Where was he standing? in the city that was known for the gates of hell. So he's saying all of this idolatry, all of this evil that has been here for generations will not prevail against the church that Jesus is building. Wow. That's pretty incredible. And this is critical for us today because what we believe about Jesus matters. It's through the correct confession of who Jesus is, that we are reconciled to him. Believing that he's a good teacher or just believing that he was a good man is not enough. We're reconciled to him because he was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And this is the confession that as a church we steward to a lost world. So after Peter makes this declaration of who Jesus is, Jesus begins to correct their wrong thinking. Remember, it's like Jesus was looking at Peter saying, Peter, 
You got the answer right, but not in the way that you think. Because the Jews, they were expecting a conquering king. They're expecting to take the Romans out. But in Matthew 8, 31 and 32, he says that he then began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And then Peter took him aside and Peter began to rebuke him. In the same way that my language teacher, when I said the person that you would have supported was this and she began to fill with rage, that's the kind of moment that Peter's having right here. Peter's realizing that the expectation that he has in a Messiah, it might be a little bit different. If he wants the conquering king, how is he going to get a conquering king if Jesus is going to suffer and die? How are the Romans going to be subject to them if Jesus is going to conquer and die? So Peter just can't wrap his brain around what's going on. He and the rest of the disciples had this wrong understanding of who Jesus was, and it had big implications for their lives. So who do you think Jesus is? What wrong assumptions do you carry on a daily basis? about who Jesus is. When I lived overseas, I remember talking to people and I would ask them this question, who do you think Jesus is? And I was astonished at how similar the responses of people today were to the responses of people from the first century. Because I would get answers like, you know, I really, I really like Jesus. I like what Jesus did for the West. I like what Jesus brought freedom. He brought good politics in a certain way. Or I like what Jesus did for the economy. I like Jesus' finances. Or I like what Jesus did for women's rights. They would have all of these assumptions about who they thought Jesus was. But they were totally missing the point. But these answers are not that different from us today. Because these answers all pointed to the fact that they wanted Jesus to come in and overthrow their political situation, overthrow their economic situation, or overthrow whatever problem it was that was plaguing them on that day. That's exactly what they wanted in the first century. They wanted Jesus to come and change everything externally and fix it. Even here in America, we're expecting Jesus to come and rescue us from oppression or from political turmoil or from rising inflation or from the rhetoric that's taught in our schools that's not that different than what was being taught in Caesarea Philippi. What we're missing, though, is exactly what the disciples were missing. The change that we need is not an external change. The change that we need is an internal change. This is what Jesus came to do and what Jesus did. He said, I see your temporal problems and I'm going to provide you with an eternal solution. So the disciples in Mark 8, they couldn't understand the implications of Jesus dying because they couldn't think past everything that they already knew. And this is what next week and the week after is all about. Palm Sunday next week, the week after that is Easter. This is what Jesus is pointing to right here in this passage is what we're going to be celebrating. So what is the implications of Jesus being the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. The first implication is if you place your faith in him, you place your faith in the work that he did on the cross, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit is covered by the sacrificial blood of Jesus. Jesus. 
pretty incredible. It also means you are dead to sin. It tells us in the scriptures that you're made new. You're not just forgiven. You also become an entirely new creation. Christ's spirit comes and it lives inside of you. And now that his spirit lives inside of you, you're something totally different than you were before. Before your identity was you were a sinner. That's who you were. Now, you're something different. Sin is not normal for you because you have Christ living inside of you. He is in you. Does that mean you won't sin? No. You're still going to sin, but who you are is changed forever. I think the best picture that we have of this is the picture of adoption. We get this picture in Scripture as well. Because when a child is adopted, they're brought into a family, they're given a new last name, and they become equal to people who were born into that family. They are now heirs alongside everyone else who was already in that family. And what did that child do to earn it? Nothing. They were chosen. They were picked. They were loved to come and now be a part of this new family. Their identity is changed. And then that child is faced with the decision. And the decision is, now what? How am I going to choose to live my life? They can live as part of who they are in this new family, or they can go back and live as who they were in their old family. How they choose to live doesn't change the reality of who they actually are. They are part of this new family. They can go out and live their life as if they were part of the others, but the reality is there's something new, even when they choose to not act like. That should bring joy. The fact that Christ lives in you should bring hope. Because it's not just that you're forgiven, it's He now lives inside of you, and it's Him who lives the Christian life through you. So what do you have to do to live the Christian life? You don't have to do anything. Jesus is the one who does it. Now, I can see you're sitting there squirming a little bit, like, preacher, no, 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 hold on just a second. What about reading the Bible? What about going to church? What about praying? Those are fantastic things. But those are things that you do as a result of who you are. You come to church so you can fellowship and be around your brothers and sisters who are also filled with, with the same spirit that you are. You read the Bible so you remember who you are. You read the Bible so you remember whose you are. Because if you don't remind yourself of who you are, you'll forget. The world that's around us, just like Caesarea Philippi, will constantly be telling you who you are. And you'll forget who you really are with the Spirit living inside you. And you'll choose to live like someone you're actually not. It's a scary place to be. The idea that I could have Christ's Spirit living inside of me, but yet I live in a way that doesn't show it because I forget who I am. Man, I don't ever want to be in that place. I pray that I never find myself, that I'm in the spot to where I forget what Jesus has done for me and who I am with his spirit inside of me. But I know that some of you here today may be in that spot. You may have forgotten the forgiveness that you have received, or you may have forgotten who you are, or you might be here today and you may have never been adopted into God's family. 
You may have never placed your faith in Jesus, asking him to forgive you for your sins and become that new creation. If that's you, don't let today pass without choosing to follow Jesus. This is incredible. He came to forgive us. He came so that he could live his life through us. This is the only hope that we have. So, if you've never given your life to Christ, I pray that today would be that day. Here in a second, I'm going to walk down to the front. And as I'm down here, if you would like somebody to pray for you, or if you've never given your life to Jesus and you'd like for today to be that today, it can happen here. Or maybe you have forgotten who you are and you need to come down and just spend some time and just pray at the altar and asking Jesus, remind me of who I am. And we'll conclude after that. But if coming down the aisle, if that's something that is intimidating for you, then afterwards we'll be outside over here in the Welcome Center. And I would encourage you to come talk to me or come talk to one of the other staff because we would love to pray with you or just encourage you in who you are in Christ. So let's stand.